Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. I was delighted to be put in touch with Ewan MacArthur, who is the general manager of the Morabit Air Museum. He, as you're going to find out, is incredibly passionate about the aircraft he works with, aviation, and how it can inform and encourage the next generations to get into science, technology, and who knows, maybe even work on aircraft themselves. So what follows is a tour of the museum as we go around and have a look at loads of the exhibits. We do make it to the bow fighter eventually. We tease you for a while, dear listener, but it is worth the wait because a lot of the stuff we see along the way is really, really special. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to me and to Ewan as we start looking around the Moravian Air Museum. So Ewan, here we are in, in the museum and... Yes. We're going to start at the oldest bit, which is quite extraordinary. What are we looking at here? Okay, what we're looking at here is the set of BE-2A wing panels. Um, they're considered to be the oldest surviving RFC, RAF, RAAF uh, pieces in the world. And we have researchers coming from all over the world to take measurements, samples, and uh, yeah, from this they've actually used it to build um, the original, well, not the original, but the... Um, replica BE-2s that are flying now. So, but these were discovered in a uh, shed down the coast uh, some years back. And uh, obviously we put them on display out of the way of <laughs> inquiring hands, uh, but we've done no resto work onto it because it's uh, important to actually have them displayed as is. Uh, but you can see obviously the quality of the work was such that uh, it's lasted well over a hundred years. Uh, and it's fascinating to see just how little of these wings uh, you know, what's inside them with the wooden spars and even the um, turnbuckles up there uh, it's all still intact so but yeah but certainly a it's a unique find and especially because they're different colors too one's got the roundel on it uh, as you can see down there and this one's a yellow one so i don't know whether that's a pre-dope or pre-final painting we just don't know that's the problem um, like you'd have in britain uh, same thing a lot of this stuff has just sat there so you don't necessarily get to find out the stories <laughs> And there's you know, the wonderful thing about them, you've got a little, little, little bit of kids' drawings on them with some squares and bits and pieces. They've, 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 <laughs> I don't think they were making aeroplane drawings on that. I reckon they were, it looks like their maths homework, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, so tell us, we started with the oldest thing in here to kick things off, but tell yeah. us about the museum. How did it start? Where's it from? So the museum started in 1962 and it was brought about by a group of people who were notified that our bow fighter was a children's uh, playground equipment down on the beach at Port Sea at a camp. Spoilers, we're going to get to the boat fighter later. Yes. <laughs> and so they rescued that, and from there, the Australian Aircraft Restoration Group, which is the, I suppose you could call it the umbrella company, uh, was formed. And the goal is to acquire, preserve, uh, and display aircraft that basically have a lot to do with Australia's aviation history. Mm -hmm. So from that small beginning, we've grown to what we are now, uh, with over 700 members and uh, around 50,000 visitors a year and uh, you know, being our 60th anniversary this year we're in the process of uh, putting together our plan for the expansion of the museum because there's still a lot of aircraft that aren't on display that I'm sure people would like to see. And just to sort of describe it to you, dear listener, we're in, we're in a hangar that has just the most fantastic collection of all kinds of different things. We've started with the BE-2 wings, we're gonna get onto something rather special in the case over there, but looking around I can see a Sabre and a Firefly and a Mirage, and the other thing that we're gonna talk about a lot a bit later on, but they're there. But we're gonna wander over here because there is a, a gentleman who flew a red airplane and you have something that's quite extraordinary from that red airplane. Yes, so to all intents and purposes, this is the uh, tank from the Red Baron's DR1 and uh, there's only one other tank that actually exists like this which is at a museum in Italy. This one was delivered to us back in 1982 by the grandchildren of a person who deceased. Now back in those days they didn't do all the paperwork so we've got no way of tracking it back to the family. However we know from looking at it you can see at the front they've got impact points from where the fuselage is pushed back into the tank which would indicate a low level accident which is pretty much how the baron came down mm -hmm. and also on the side where the supports are it's been hacked out in a great hurry um, looks like there's either been hacked off with an axe or uh, hacksaw 
Uh, the other thing that always struck us was why would somebody go to the effort of bringing something like this back from the front unless it had some sort of special meaning and relevance. Because uh, it, it's not little, is it? It's no, and it's heavy. Like, yeah. It's actually very heavy. Ironically, I had this sitting on my uh, kitchen table at one point because we didn't know what it was and we were... Uh, thinking of putting it up on eBay and we just asked a couple of questions online and we got besieged within minutes of, you know, do you know what you've got? And I was like, well, no, can you please tell us? <laughs> We're all flying blind, literally. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a very special piece. And having spoken to a lot of preeminent researchers uh, with um, the Baron, basically everybody's like, look, it's pretty much it. Nothing else of this size has ever turned up uh, other than the engine. So let's you know, we have to assume that it is the case. And the Baron made modifications too to his aircraft, which this particular tank was being used around the time of his aircraft, and it actually then became standard for all the other models of the DR1 afterwards. So we've got a Canadian here and an Australian, so we're not going to have that debate because, well, we'll just fall out and we'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, it is remarkable, and it's... Like you're saying, it is, it is a big bit of stuff that you're going to lug around and mm. it's not your usual battlefield trophy you'd throw in your kit bag mm. and bring home. No, and I think it's, it's definitely a combination, I think, of copper and brass, uh, which would also add to the weight. So you know, bringing that back on a ship is going to take up space and I'm sure people coming back from the front wouldn't have been allowed to necessarily take too much back because they were coming home in relatively small boats and uh, you know, space would have been at a premium. Very much so. It is a fantastic, fantastic bit of kit and... He's just trying to place it. So I guess that's sort of just in front of the front of the cockpit yep, and right. behind the engine. But it's 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 really really quite something. Yeah. Where that hole is there, that would have been the gauge. Mm -hmm. So uh, pilots could see the gauge you know, sticking up um, out, and uh, they'd be able to read it. The other interesting thing is it's actually oil and fuel. Oh right. Okay. So yeah. the 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 rivet points on it that's separate in the tank. Yeah, yeah. It's so uh, this one here. It says OEL for oil. Uh, yep. It's got the lid on it. And then that one missing the lid, but uh, apparently that's one of the fuel tanks, or the fuel tank. So somebody had challenged us and said, oh, it was out of a DR1 that was a souvenir trophy of war uh, that was in the exhibition buildings in the city when it burnt down in the 20s. But I can find no evidence of um, fire damage or anything like that, especially with the valve underneath. You can see there, mm -hmm. it's actually got a lot of fabric still attached to it and there's no sign of any burning or anything like that. So again, it uh, points back at the original direction. And you said it was brass and copper? Yeah. Yeah, and that, that would tarnish, and especially if it was heat, heat, heated in the fire. Yeah, it fire would be yeah. an absolute mess, yeah. you guarantee to that. So so there you go. So yeah, it's, a, it's one that's always a talking point when people come in, that's for sure. And it's at the direct opposite end to your, your other special thing, which we're going to get. I'm just going to keep <laughs> teasing it, because I can, I can see the bow fighter sitting over there, but we're not going to rush to it, ladies and gentlemen. But you, you have an absolutely beautiful gypsy moth here yes. as well. Yes. This one, um, amongst other things, was used to deliver newspapers out in the country. And it was actually used by one of the first female pilots in Australia. She owned it. And uh, it ended up with us. And it's had a bit of work done on it over the years. But essentially, it's still the same old, same old. I don't remember when we ran, last ran the engine. A lot of these, whilst they're static exhibits, we do um, have a lot of them that are um, capable of running their engines. And we often get asked the question, well, why don't you fly them all like some of the other museums? Biggest, one of the biggest things with our museum is that we have some of the rarest and oldest examples in the world. And if you had an accident, not worth it. It'll mm -hmm. just simply, it's gone for good. Uh, we'd much rather have them up close, bring them out on a cockpit day and uh, fire them up and let people hear it in all its glory at uh, close quarters. Of, of course, because you know, I guess there's going to be people saying, why don't you restore the, the BE2 wings that are over there, but why would you? Because they are fantastic. Then, then it doesn't become sort of yeah. as much of a, uh, uh, I suppose you could call it a relic um, mm. or an artefact. It doesn't become that much of a thing then. If people are already doing um, you know, reproductions and things like that, that's where that belongs. Yeah. So you know, this is history and it deserves to stay you know, in a preserved state, and that's what obviously we do, but uh, we need to really ensure that uh, it's kept as original as possible. That's not, that's not to say that we don't replace pieces, because we do. Um, mm -hmm. As, as anybody knows, I mean, a lot of these aircraft are, you know, 80 years old and then some, um, and they weren't designed to last the distance. And the big problem we have uh, at the moment, aside from space, is a number of the aircraft are outside, and they suffer from uh, corrosion from the conditions. So we're close to the sea, uh, for the listeners. We're not too far away. 
Uh, so the salt air just gets in and absolutely fizzes everything out. So, so underneath the gypsy moth, there is the flying suit of a very well-known aviator, and you have aviator inspired because he was Sydney Carson, because he's his family's down this way yes. t today, isn't he? So who yes. was Sydney Cotton and? Why do you have what looks like a fantastic 70s jumpsuit in a case? <laughs> it wouldn't look out of place in a 70s nightclub, really, when you <laughs> see it like that. Um, Sydney Cotton actually developed the Sidcot suit, which is one of the first proper flying suits uh, to assist um, with temperature control and uh, all of that sort of stuff. Not only that, though, he, he developed a lot of things. I mean, you think about it, um, some of the research when I was reading up on it, he developed the bubble windows. Mm -hmm. So you could actually look back rather than sort of trying to crane your head out and stick your head out and all of that kind of thing. He even developed the special, um, uh, it was the colour, the camouflage colour, the sky blue for the aircraft mm -hmm. when they're flying. And uh, in amongst all of that, he um, did the uh, very clever thing of um, being a spy in terms of taking, I think it was German people, um, he was taking them over various places and he actually equipped or hid some cameras in the wings and got a whole bunch of photos for the RAF. So he also got in a lot of trouble back here, though, with a few uh, bodgy business deals and stuff like that. So, he, he, yeah. he was a bit of a boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. A bit of a larrikin. Um, so, there you go. Yeah. yeah. So he did, he did. He certainly did all sorts of things. But uh, yeah, um, I think his legacy is that uh, he certainly paved the way for a lot of stuff going forward. There's no question. Definitely. And we're going to have more Sydney Cotton related things because um, his Lockheed's just been engine run up at um, Cywell the other week. Ah, oh, okay, uh, yep. Put, putting yep. that back together. No, oh, nice. And um, of course my, my mate Tony Hoskins yep. is getting his PR spit all together, which there will be more on this show yep. about that. Ah, oh, beautiful. But there we go. Right, where, where should we go next year? Ooh, good question. Actually, let's have, just have a look over here. We've just put them together. It seems a bit crazy that we'd actually have one of these. But it's a UMO4 engine from an ME262. After the war, there was a number of these that were basically given to various institutions for research purposes and things like that. And inevitably, they ended up in museums and that sort of stuff, just like us. So ours is essentially um, sectionised slightly, so it's got perspex so you can see all the turbine blades in the middle. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a hellishly heavy engine, though. Um, it was interesting, actually, again, reading up on the two the UMOs, they really suffered from a lot of performance issues uh, going in towards the end of the war because of the uh, um, basically the low quality of materials. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of engine failures. I'm just reading Dan Sharp's new book about the 262, okay, yep. and, which is really good, and the, um, the sort of, not so much the battle, but the, well, it is a battle to yeah. get the, the, the BMW engine and, and this working, and this just being that little bit better, but yeah. nev they never managed to so solve the weight problem. Really, no. No, there was, there was all sorts of things. But then directly next to it, that was sort of, it was coming around the same time. Um, Rolls-Royce was already moving into its own jet era. So we've got one of the Derwents here um, that's uh, uh, you know, basically on display. And uh, these ones were used uh, largely in the Meteors um, over here. So, yeah, again, these things for us, it's not a case of us running out and buying them. They often just get offered to us. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there might be, say, somewhere from RAAF Heritage, for instance, who donated the uh, sabre that's over there uh, to sometimes... I had an odd one a couple of years back where there was an office that was closing down, um, you know, nothing to do with aviation, yet they had a uh, an Avon engine on display. They are like, do you want it? Sure, OK, we'll take it. <laughs> uh, it does happen. Uh, and that's great, because rather than for it to go to the scrap heap or the tip or whatever, which we've seen plenty of before, uh, we really want to make sure that, uh, that say, um, uh, you know, these things are kept and put on display for everybody to enjoy. And that's one of our bigger goals too, of course, is that we really like having a chance for people to you know, encourage you know, future aviators and that kind of thing, because it's very important um, going forward, especially uh, you want to encourage people to uh, take a career. 100%, and it's... You, you've you know, just being able to see the differences between the German engine and the centrifugal British one, mm. it's, it, they, it's they are chalk and cheese with them, oh, massive. Yeah. But we've just walked past your Harry Hocker display. Yes. 
Now, being a hawker fanboy of the highest regard, yes. I can't walk past without <laughs> asking why you have a Harry Hawker. Well, because Harry Hawker, well, this was Harry Hawker Airport originally. Uh -huh. So this, <laughs> would you believe the, uh, well, the airport was going to remove this and put it in storage, but we took it instead because it's, I think it's very important because of his uh, uh, involvement, obviously, with Hawker naturally and the uh, impact that he had which was incredible so and not only that most important thing was he was buried uh, buried he was born here in yes. Moorabbin so yeah uh, we've had, had quite a few sort of uh, links to those sort of things in the past and especially when you sort of think uh, too I mean we had uh, Houdini do his big um, flight over the other side of town which really? was yeah 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 he bought that uh, the voice and over oh, yeah. and that was the big flight that was the first really major flight uh, in Australia, I have spent some time trying to work, trying to research where the voice might have ended up. Gone, I think. Uh, all his possessions were found in a warehouse back in 1953, but uh, the trail went dead. I even went as far as contacting the uh, magicians' union in, in the UK. <laughs> you got to try. Uh, this is the thing, though. With all this stuff, you've got to try every angle uh, in order to just tick it all off, just in case, because you never know. Somebody might then go, "Oh, I know somebody." Uh, There's a box in somebody's garage. That's right. Yeah. Well, and that's how, the, like the Baron's tank, that's probably yeah. a prime example. So so now you're standing in front of the Sea Venom, uh, which is part of the naval collection uh, that we have. It's one of the bigger naval collections, actually, in the country. And, uh, again, de Havilland... Oh, well, I mean, there's so much wood in these things. <laughs> Any, anything to do with de Havilland seems to be wood-based. <laughs> it's not fair on them, but, uh, again... Uh, one of the big things that we do here at the museum is we actually have a number of uh, cockpits that we keep open, uh, which are restored. And again, for people to experience what it's like to have been a pilot during those times, but also with our 737, to be a pilot now. And uh, again, gives them the feel, and if they're really into it, then um, the airport itself is actually the second busiest in the country on movement, purely because of the amount of training that goes on here. There's just a ridiculous number of training schools here. So they're all training to be pilots, so that's what we like to encourage. And it, it's it's a gateway drug, isn't it? You, it is. You, you sit in something fascinating like like the sea venom, which you're probably not going to see in many other places, no. and, and it, you get the bug. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, you know, for somebody like me, who uh, fortunately the visitors, you know, the listeners can't uh, see me, but I'm six foot six and uh, not quite as wide, but you know, I'm getting there with middle-aged slump. And it's uh, it's actually very tricky to get in and out of some of these aircraft when we're cleaning. Um, it's almost like you have to pour yourself out <laughs> forward. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, I've been for a, a couple of spins in uh, friends' aircrafts, and uh, you know they, they pull the throttle on, and it's like I should be sitting cross-legged because you end up getting injured. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's not a, look, it's not easy for somebody my height, and it, it makes you uh, respect it all the more. Um, you know, obviously having just done you know commercial flying and all of that as a passenger, I really. Uh, struggle to fathom with some of these people, some of these pilots, like say getting to the Venom for instance, you've got the jets getting ready to go, all of that, then the canopy comes down and you're literally sealed in that bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite confronting in that way. A bit different with say the Bristol aircraft where uh, you go up through the floor and then they close it behind you. Again, it's still quite a confronting thing, there's not a way of getting out really. Yeah. Not, not for the claustrophobic of no. those of us among us. Absolutely yeah. not. So, uh, yeah, so the jet age is sort of, well, part of the jet age is obviously represented by the Sea Venom and the uh, Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation Sabre, which is the licence built version of the F 86. So, that's, you, you've mentioned the CAC. Yes. So, you've got the CAC, and then the, the bow fighter is a. G a DAP GAF, yeah. yeah. So, so who 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 were they? Because okay, you, so you've got a fantastic yeah. collection, and I believe Oop. your boomerang is off being put back together. So we're not going to be able to get to see her, are we? No, she's in a hundred million pieces yeah. at the moment. But uh, that's that's pretty much the way. Unfortunately, we've got that many restos going. So CAC is the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation, which was formed by a conglomerate uh, back in the thirties, and they went on to not only license build things like the Wirraway Sabre. Uh, and the like. But they came up with iconic aircraft like the Boomerang. Uh, they also came up with um, other um, concepts like the CA-11 Woomera. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they had the Wacker Trainer and all of that. After the war, uh, as you'll see shortly, they diversified and had to go into other things in order to survive. 
um, because it obviously there wasn't just that there wasn't that need for production aircraft anymore. Um, and then literally across the road or across the way was the Department of Aircraft Production, uh, which later became the Government Aircraft Factories, um, and they were responsible for the Beauforts, bow fighters, and uh, all of that sort of stuff. So um, interesting story. Uh, it's worthy of a note. The designer of the boomerang was uh, an Austrian Jew by the name of Fred David. And uh, he was originally working for Heinkel, mm -hmm. designing aircraft. And he had to flee. So I don't know why, but he went to Japan. Okay. Which, which is an odd place to decide to, to run. Might Most have been the only way out. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's uh, And then from at, in over there, he worked for... It was Aichi Mitsubishi, something like that, and then had to flee again. So he came to Melbourne. He was still treated as an alien and had to report to the police stations. Yet he designed the boomerang, and that was obviously why it was such a powerhouse aircraft, because he was using all the knowledge that he'd developed uh, after that. And he also had a lot to do with the CA-15 uh, Mustang, which was the Super Mustang, which never went into production. It was just That's just a mock-up cockpit that's over there. Um, widely considered it would have been a fantastic fighter aircraft, but it just arrived too late in the war. But uh, yeah, good old Fred just lived out his days out in the eastern suburbs. Quiet. Nobody really knew of his um, impact, apparently. So, yeah, some, some of them are like that. They just like to do their thing. That's it. No. And the, the boomerang is fascinating because it's, you know, it's sort of it's been kind of dismissed in many things as a, as a stopgap and things, but it's a very clever design. It's oh, it is, and an incredibly capable fighter. Well, it was. I mean, that's the thing. And uh, look, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's actually quite a. Uh, I consider it to be kind of like an icon iconic aircraft in that regard. Um, I mean, we had to do a lot of stopgaps here anyway, purely on the basis of supply issues. Things like that. I mean, you know, the, the Beauforts were going to have huge problems originally because uh, we couldn't get the Taurus engines. Mm -hmm. So, hence, we had to move to Pratt and Whitney's. Um, uh, at one point, there was uh, talk that uh, I've seen the wind tunnel models of the Beaufighter with right cyclone engines mm -hmm. because, again, Hercules engines were problematic. So, uh, it's just, it's an ongoing, it was always an ongoing issue. So, whatever supplies you got, uh, you may do with, and certainly by the end, uh, end of the war with the later model boomerangs, they were utilising parts from the Woomera because that never went into production. Uh, they were putting you know, trim tab wheels and things like that into the, uh, into the assemblies. So, yeah, it's kind of... Some of them ended up being more of a hodgepodge than they probably should have, but that's nah, just how it is. So we, we're getting over towards it, but we got an absolutely stunning Firefly yes. as well, which, again... One of, one of those aircraft that kind of looks right and kind of doesn't, if you know what I mean. I suppose it looks a bit a bit sort of odd in here because uh, being naval and because of our space issues, we've got the wings folded up and it stands, it sits next to the um, sea venom, so both of them have got wings up. Firefly was just one of those, it, it certainly served its purpose mm -hmm. really well. Uh, I, I just find it uh, yeah, typical as travesty that a lot of them just ended up on fire dumps in Australia. Mm. So... There's very few of them around. How many of them are um, actually exist now in the world anyway? So there's one flying out in the States at the moment. Yep. Um, I think the Fleet Air Arm Museum has one. I yes. don't know. And I know that um, Navy Wings are desperately trying to get their hands on one to, to, to fly. But That's the problem. I mean, again, for trying to find the parts now. Yeah. Uh, it's just an ongoing issue. So, again, you probably have to... You could build one from scratch, I'm sure, if you got access to the drawings. But uh, do the drawings exist? There's the other issue. And, and then cost. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, this is uh, this whole thing is a really good way of burning holes in your pockets uh, <laughs> and the moths inside your <laughs> wallet. So. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, which, which is why we all love Paul Allen as much as we did, because he did have the pockets to do lots of crazy stuff. Yeah, you, you do need sort of people who have got deep pockets to build up those collections. Same with Kermit Weeks. Yeah. Um, those kind of people have you know, got absolutely ridiculous collections, but they're pouring the money into it, and the legacy will be that we have those for people to, or generations to enjoy um, you know, going forward. And I think that's absolutely critical. So uh, we need to get a we need to get an engine for this. It doesn't have an engine, which is a shame. Ah, it doesn't. Anyone out there who'd like to uh, send over a Griffin? Um, please get in touch. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I will ask around when I get home. Uh, 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 so uh, no, it's, it's a bit tricky, um, especially with the engine side of things. Uh, 
and that's always problematic. We've got engines for the boat, but that's no problem. Getting replacement parts for a sleeve valve radial like the um, Hercules is just a nightmare. Yeah. Now, that seems to be sort of even harder than the Merlins or anything like that. But that just seems to be the most challenging uh, aspect in uh, any sort of restoration, let alone even trying to get new um, propellers done for the bow fighter. Uh, it's one of them's really pitted, so I can't turn that side on. Yeah, H having a bit of experience with sleeve valve engines, they, they're wonderful things, but not now. No, <laughs> they would have been fantastic in the late 40s. No yeah. problem with that. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's that. So right before we go over yes. there, I want to talk to you about your Sabre. Yes, because she's the new one. Yes, and it's yeah, I guess. Coming back to the Canadian Australian thing, we had the Canada Air ones, you had the CAC ones. Yes. What's her story? Because uh, she's, she, I love the Sabre. It's, she's, yeah, she's not bright silver, but uh, I guess in, in this sort of sun, you don't particularly want it to be bright silver. You kind of want it to be more uh, reflective, I think. Um, so this one was uh, stationed up north and uh, was basically being used as a gate guardian. And so they, uh, uh, it was originally part of a deal that uh, went south, um, but they let us keep this anyway uh, in a gesture of goodwill, which was very kind of them. And uh, all we had to do was um, we cleaned up the canopy, which is now full of finger marks, which happens with visitors getting in. Uh, and uh, we got an instrument panel and an ejector seat. And uh, yeah, again, look, it's a hugely popular thing. I mean, it's a compact uh, jet too. I've always found them to be... Uh, quite a small footprint compared to, I mean, if you look behind you, the Mirage is an absolute monster. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, and getting parts for the Sabre too to uh, do work on and all of that is quite easy still. <laughs> so it's, that's not so bad. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been done really well. So, um, and around the side, we've, on the other side, we've got the panel open for people to understand how the armament worked. Um, again, sort of the thing of educating people. You, know, you can just show them a whole fuselage and go, oh, here's a plane, but then if you actually have some of the panels off and go, no, well, this is part of the nuts and bolts. Uh, and, I, and I often say to people when they're doing the Bowfighter tour uh, as well, it's like, you, know, you wouldn't believe just how much of it's bike chain and cable, wire cable. Mm -hmm. There ain't a lot there. And uh, it's quite terrifying to think, but they knew what they were doing. So, uh, yeah, but uh, it's always a... Um, an interesting thing to be able to just sort of stick your head in and have a look, uh, even to the uninitiated. So I'm looking at that and seeing a cannon. That's part of the Aiden system, yeah. yeah. So um, naturally we don't have the Aiden in there. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the legislation is, is pretty hard with those sort of things, but our Aiden's actually a sectionised training aid, so mm -hmm. uh, we've also got one of the cannons out of the Bowfighter in storage, but again, that's been um, welded, so it can't be yeah. used. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, too, with that sort of stuff nowadays, it'd be quite uh, almost impossible to get ammunition. Yeah. So, um, but still, you know, if you get uh, 3D printing done mm. of various guns and armaments, uh, you can get in a lot of trouble still. <laughs> you still need permits, <laughs> so you've got to be good about it, even if it is just a solid barrel and everything. So, uh, we haven't looked down that path. So, we'll get, we'll get there. I'm, I'm just thinking as well, because that, we're looking at the breach here in the, yep. um, in, that's right next to the, the pilot seat. That must have been brutal, because the, the 50s would have been further up here. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that modification to put the much, a pair of much bigger guns in it yeah. would have been it quite was, something. I, I, think it was, I think it was a pretty, uh, I suppose you could call it meaty approach. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, for, the, for that sort of thing to be happening next to the pilot with not a lot of... Uh, um, sort of space and uh, certainly not a lot of insulation or sound no. padding or anything. It would have been, um, yeah. You wonder why some of these pilots ended up with hearing issues. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, I know one of my uh, um, uh, cousins who originally flew Oxfords and Ansons ended up with permanent hearing damage because he couldn't, um, they were always had the windows open to listen for the engines to make sure they were running okay. And of course that uh, came back to bite him at some point. Yes. So. Yeah. Whereas, whereas for me, it was loud bands in dodgy pubs with terrible PAs. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I, I learned to uh, I learned to use earplugs very early on in the piece. <laughs> These things are actually kind of interesting. Um, in Australia, <coughs> during the war, we had twelve PBM Mariners, uh, and the, only twelve. And after they after the war ended, they're all scrapped. So we don't have a Mariner left in the country. However, these were found on a farm. So, we don't know which one, because all the plates get taken off. They're always taken by the souvenir hunters pretty quick. 
However, so we've got two, we've got a pair of these and we've just uh, taken, well, we're about to take delivery of a rudder. All right, so you, you've got a pair of the outboard um, outboard wings, wings yeah. That, 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 oh, here, there's a picture of it here. That yeah. sort of strange gold shaped yeah. um, configuration it had on the, the flying boat. Yeah, God, they're huge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely enormous. Um, you know, the tips have been cut uh, at some point. Uh, I would suspect probably because there wasn't enough room <laughs> up the top. Um, so it actually looks like there's a bird's nest up there now, too. Oh, dear. Bird, uh, birds we can cope with. I'm in Australia. Yeah. I was dreaming about spiders the other night. Oh. Not good. <laughs> yeah, so you know, it's nice to at least have these things and again to be able to tell the story and say, look, we had 12 of these. This is all that's left. Uh, it mightn't seem much to the average person, but then inevitably you get somebody who then goes out to the front office on the way out and said, oh, my dad flew these. Yeah. And this is fantastic to see and understand what they flew. And that's always the thing. Um, our chairman's always fond of saying, you know, these are you know, dead aircraft or bits of dead metal. But it's all the stories that go into it that make it what it is. Oh, 100%. It's, you know, they, they are inanimate objects until you put somebody in them. Oh, totally, totally. So, and again, seeing something like this over here, which is a Sunderland turret. Um, I don't think there's that much of Sunderlands anywhere no. left. So, uh, again, it's just nice to have one of those. I have got into that before to do put the model in and put the lighting in, and I'm glad I didn't have claustrophobia because there is no way I could sit in that for any length of time. That's not a big thing for a gentleman of stature yes. to um, get into. Yeah, no, they're tiny. So, uh, yeah, it'd be nice to find uh, other bits, but again, they've been, if they're not in people's collections, they went to the scrappies ages ago. So, um, to give you a, a, an idea of a tragic story, we have a mosquito wing, which was never, uh, sorry, a mosquito tail fin there, which was never used. And back in the day, the museum was promised a mosquito and they, uh, all the mosquitoes were up at the uh, scrapping yards at Tokemore, just over the border, mm -hmm. which they chopped up about 750 aircraft after the war. Anyway, the guys at the time drove up to get the mosquito and bring it home, and as they rounded the corner, they saw a big pile of smoke. Oh, no! And it was the last mozzie, and they torched it. There was a place that they called the executioner's block where they actually took the mosquitoes out onto this concrete block and set fire to them and there's plenty of pictures of it around and uh, yeah they um, basically got all the molten metal once it had settled i'd been up there a couple of times even now after the rains on that particular property uh you still find little bits and pieces come up so that's it's sad i mean that's the thing but nobody had that foresight i guess to uh preserve those things at the time otherwise they'd be a lot cheaper now Yes. <laughs> that's, that's always the way, isn't it? It's, uh, when you think about it, it's like, oh, you know, it could have been uh, something. So, this, and this here it was a donation not that long ago. Somebody came in and just said, oh, yeah, my granddad cut it off uh, a Fiat CR32. Um, so, for the listeners, it's the wing fabric, and it's got the famous uh, three. Well, it's it's the it's the axes. The axes. Yeah. yeah, they call them axes or. Uh, yeah, it's an axe bound with three rods. Strength through unity implies power, so it's basically the Faskies. Um, so, yeah, the head of fascism. So, but again, important history. Doesn't necessarily pertain to a an Australian theme collection. However, it is an important part of World War II history, given the fact you know, we were actively involved. Yeah, and especially North Africa with huge oh, Australian yeah. con contingent out there. Absolutely, absolutely. But these two things here. Uh, the largest surviving parts of the CA-11 Woomera, which was designed as a twin-engine bomber, and it would have been an absolutely fantastic aircraft, but it suffered from all sorts of design problems with shutter, mm. and as a result, uh, the project got cancelled. They did order uh, 80, they made parts for 20. Um, the prototype CA-4 crashed and yeah so it just ended up they cancelled it it just dragged on so long that by the time it was almost good to go you know kitty hawks and mustangs and everything were on the scene you know, they were far more agile so we've got a gun turret and recently uh, a set of undercarriage uh, leg and wheels came in from a gentleman who had them sitting in his garage <laughs> need i say more <laughs> that's uh, Again, the same, same old, uh, always the same thing. It's, uh, oh, I've got these, I was going to send them to the tip. Would you like them? Well, of course we'd like them. 
So you've got to love playing geeks in their collections. Well, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have what we've got now. So now I reckon what we do, uh, we might go outside. Yes. For a minute. Dear listener, we are walking away from the bow fighter, but we will be back. I know, I'm teasing him. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm being really mean. So. <laughs> oh, no, it's, uh... And what is nice, after two rather horrible days in Melbourne, it is absolutely gorgeous yeah, today. Yeah, it's, uh, it's finally about time. It still feels a bit wet underfoot, but uh, it's definitely better than what we had. Now, over there is one of our hellishly long restorations going on, which is the Catalina. Yeah. Now, that Catalina is actually the only surviving original black cat. Really? There are other ones done up as black cats, but they are not real black cats. So, yeah, this one's A2488. And after the war, uh, some of these were converted into caravans. Uh, this one, on the other hand, was converted into a houseboat for the Murray River. Oh, wow. And so when we got it, uh, one of our life members aged about... 20 years, which would make him probably 104 now, but uh, he spent the best part of two and a half years hand chiseling all the concrete ballast out of it. Oh, Yeah, that's a job. It's dedication, but it's an absolute sort of a job. Uh, so you can imagine the damage because the Murray River is actually a very salty <laughs> river, uh, so we have problems with that. So that's just uh, an unfortunate. And when I was talking to you earlier about the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation having to diversify, they started making buses. <laughs> yeah. That's actually one of the most popular with the kids. So that actually uh, ran out in the northern suburbs for many years and then was donated to us. Um, the engine's almost ready and uh, be able to take it out for a spin. Oh, fantastic. But uh, CAC actually, not only did they do this, they built houses, uh, they built, well, they made saucepans, pressure cookers, um, they made things for measuring the length of root systems under the ground. They were doing all sorts of things. They even made the cooling towers for one of the power plants down in um, La Trobe Valley. And by the time it became Hawker de Havilland, they were responsible for doing the spire on the art centre in the city. All oh, right. So you see, sort of, it still went on and on and on. Obviously a lot less going on uh, until it was finally all consumed and Boeing took over um, the location down at Fisherman's Bend. And now they make components for the 787 Dreamliners. So. Yeah, it's just part of a whole global uh, construction facility. But still with those direct links back to the original. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, this one's one of our uh, In you bigger go. aircraft, Bristol. Oh. One oh. of the most distinctive shaped aircraft, I think, the Bristol Freighter. Has to be. Yeah. Has to be, and I, um, I know it may seem odd that we've got tables in here, but uh, we actually hold kids' birthday parties in here, and it is booked out constantly. Because <laughs> I mean, it's great. I mean, what's not to like about having a birthday party in a real aircraft, one whose nose opens out and we keep it open? Um, it really is quite a fantastic uh, experience for them. I love it. So, yeah, but. Uh, uh, they always say, oh, well, where's the cockpit? And it's like, well, I'm standing under it. So <laughs> it's, uh, um, yeah, it's quite a... Uh, uh, have you been up in one before? No, I haven't. Okay, so let me find the, let me find the magic plug. And let me undo that. This is how the pilots did it. We were so, saying to... We actually met a pilot who flew it recently. And uh, I said to him, oh, yeah, we've got problems with it leaking. He's like, oh, don't worry, it leaked all the time anyway. <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? Well, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> so it's a, you know, we, here's us thinking that it's a, an ongoing battle. Um, just, there we go. Yeah. Similar sort of premise to the bow fighter. Up you go. Right. <laughs> Let's do this. And I'm not coming up because <laughs> it's, you know how I talked about claustrophobia and all of that sort of stuff? Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> right. There we go. Desperately trying to find every handhold. There we are. They don't give you many handles for the, getting it. The, the red handle, yeah, the red handles are the usual ones you get. And again, what I was saying, it was quite confronting, <clears throat> thinking about having uh, everything closed behind you. The, you'd have somebody down here... Um, <clears throat> below you and they'd pull the hatch shut and that'd be it. You'd be locked up there on your own. 
Which, for an, an aircraft this big, I did not think this was going to be as small as it is. Yeah, well, it, it's the same with the Bowfighter, as you'll see. It's the reverse Doctor Who principle. It's smaller on the inside. That, that's filling me with confidence. But, oh, fantastic. I do love the Bristol... Um, Bristol logo on the, the rudder pedals. Oh, it's awesome, isn't it? When yeah. you see stuff like that, you know you're dealing with the real thing. So, but yeah, it's a, it's very, um, it, it's definitely cramped. There's no question about it. So, just to describe it, dear listener, we, I'm sort of six foot one. I am literally bent double, and I'm banging my back on. <laughs> <laughs> On the ceiling, it is. It is not big. Uh, of course, you, usual there. Two two seats, an engineer's seat, I'm guessing, or just a yep yeah, behind me, and then instrumentation, all that sort of business at the back. But it is fantastic. But again, the visibility reminds me a lot of a DC3. That sort of very small letterbox. It's sort not of, much. It's not. Yeah. It's not big. There's no doubt about it. So, and I must admit, the pilot who we met, uh, who flew this aircraft, he wasn't very big, but. You've got to wonder if there was height restrictions on some of these. I, I'm glad he wasn't very big, because on a long flight with, with this, you'd be cramped up something nasty. Oh, totally. And there's no way of actually getting back down here and, like, stretching your legs, because it's full of cargo. Oh, of course, because the hatch would be shut down. They'd Everything fill would be it shut. Up and, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, and this would be full, whether it had uh, you know, seafood going between Melbourne and Tassie, <laughs> uh, whether it had horses, which it did, cars, other aeroplanes. He said one of his big jobs was transporting potato chips. So, I don't know, they could have come down here and had a party, but uh, there's just no space. Uh, it's just a, yeah, it's a very, very um, close and confined quarter, which seems to be a Bristol thing. So, if, even if you look at the um, cockpit of the Beaufort, for instance, it's pretty cramped in there. It's not, it's not exactly a um, you know, spacious uh, layout, and the Beaufort is just as bad. I, I, won, I wonder if the Bristol designers were, were small men who were... Have to, have been, yeah. <laughs> have to have been midgets or something because it's, it's just, yeah, defies description. Right, while I'm up here, I'm just going to grab a quick little couple of snaps because this really is quite something. It's also very warm in here, so being dressed for flying back to the UK is, um, was maybe a mistake. Nah, don't worry. It heats, that, again, that, and that's the other problem. It heats up. So here we go. Now, I'm also very aware that there's a spider's web over there, oh, so okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not putting this onto my face so that people can't see just how terrified I actually <laughs> am right now. But this is, again, really quite, really quite something. Super. Right, let's see if I can get down without breaking anything. <laughs> That's the other <laughs> You sort of think. <laughs> Let's see if we can get it shut. Oh, I love the smell of that old aircraft type smell. It's sort of grease, leather, and sweat, isn't yeah, it? it is pretty much. <laughs> That's it. In a nutshell. There's the latch. I've actually been personally interested in along the way is actually is the different types of lettering styles for things like placards and data plates and uh, things like that. I mean, it's it's all a lost art in terms of um, being able to draw those things from scratch. Nowadays, it's all done on computer, which I totally get. But you can tell, say for instance, Bristol has a certain font. Yeah, the CAC stuff has another font, and trying to replicate them can sometimes be quite hard. Um, I've managed to do it with the CAC one largely, but again, it takes a lot of time to then uh, build it within a computer program so that it can then be done for replacement placards and things like that. But so it's just a, it's an aspect that I have a particular interest in. So there's there's no font libraries for them or anything like that. They've got to be. No, no, the closest, the closest thing for uh, the CAC plates was a font called Copper Plate Gothic Bold, but it has the little serifs on the ends, mm. and the CAC stuff doesn't have that. So I had to go in and manually correct every letter uh, 
which took a while and then it had to be stretched out a certain way too so <laughs> yeah fiddly but it's worth it so you know you want one things to be as authentic as possible so so this was another donation which came from Wagga which was the same place the Sabre came from mm -hmm. so again came down as a empty shell and then we uh, populated the uh, insides this is a this is a locally built GAF Canberra number 226 again that's even more cramped I reckon yeah. in some ways I knew the guy that flew um, flew the one down well, it must have been what, 10 15 years ago now yeah and uh, the thing I always remember him saying is that the air conditioning only works um, when you're in flight oh great and they got held on the ground in Singapore for 25 minutes and the guys in the back basically melted yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's a, I guess it's a really good way of losing weight it's like having your own personal sauna <laughs> but that's not much chop when you're actually trying to go out on uh, and, so, and see here obviously this is sort of indicative this has all been repainted but it's going to have to be repainted again because it's starting to suffer from being exposed outside it's just a it's an ongoing frustration hence the need to get everything indoors which is what the, the whole plan is <laughs> We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. Hello there, I'm Matthew Moss from Fighting on Film, the podcast for war movie fans. From the beaches of Normandy to the days of chivalry and swords, if it's been captured on film, we aim to cover it. Featuring top guests from the world of entertainment, historians and industry insiders, we bring you a unique look at the films from our favourite genre. Listen wherever you find your podcasts or find us at fightingonfilm.com. The old mighty Viscount. Yeah, there's a good story about this. All right then, that's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> this actually came from Air Cubana. Oh wow. Better than that, it was Castro's personal transport. <laughs> so, we found no cigars, but that's okay, that doesn't matter. So it ended up, after serving over there, it came over here uh, and used by TAA. And uh, after it was decommissioned, it ended up being used at a amusement park out in the eastern suburbs and uh, yes yeah, uh, they sort of did their own restoration which involved putting all the seats backwards and uh, TVs and it was a mess so yeah but uh, no no the uh, it's now here uh, waiting to go indoors we do have the tail as you can see it's not there at the moment and the reason it's not there because if you can see those two towers the little NDB well not little they're big NDB yeah. towers out the back they communicate still with the aircraft and everything. If the tail was on here, it'd actually interfere. <laughs> so, what, again, once we're indoors, it becomes a different thing. Yeah. So, that's part of uh, the long-term goal. But inside the Viscount, what we've also done is uh, we've put uh, a tape loop on with announcements and things like that. We've also got um, uh, the gyro in the cockpit operating that you can hear the sounds of mm -hmm. and we actually get psychologists bringing in clients to help them get over their fear of flying by using that right. area which is terrific that's what you that's what we really want to have yeah. so now this one this this aircraft is a funny one you know people either like it or they just think it's absolutely ugly how, uh, how, can, just, how can you not love a gannet i'm sorry it's it's the sort it. of thing you draw when you're a kid yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it looks like it's it's had too much pudding. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's an interesting aircraft. It's um, this one was uh, actually there's a picture of it being towed along Beach Road, uh, way back uh, on a truck, and before we had uh, all the safety rules and permits and everything, it's one of the guys on the back of it. <laughs> pushing up the power lines with a foil, <laughs> like a wooden fork just to get under so it's uh yeah but yeah people are fascinated obviously by the contra props mm -hmm. um kids sort of you know like oh why has it got two okay well yeah plenty of reasons for that it's there are people that have uh their family have worked on them in the past and they all seem terribly fond of it which is great so but again there's not a lot in the way of uh spare parts so we're really looking for bits now to try and complete the cockpit. You used to work with a guy, B.W. Smith, used to fl fly them off HMS Eagle. Okay, yeah. And he, he, his excuse for being put on that and not something more exciting was that he was a terrible shot. Right. So they put him on the slowest airplane hunting, the only thing that was slower than him. 
<laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> it's, I think it's yeah. You know, people had said it was a the pilots had said it was a great aircraft, just a bit cumbersome. Mm. Uh, which, looking at its design, yes, I would suggest that it's cumbersome. But I think they used a, a lot for uh, radar ops and things like okay. that out here. So uh, a lot. And as, talking to people, to a lot of our aircraft on display. Yeah, so even with the F-111, for instance, mm -hmm. they ne never really saw active service. Yeah. So a lot of them sort of missed the boat, as it were. So, you know, but, you know the gun it certainly saw some service, but, uh, yeah, again, we'd really like to get it all done up and uh, basically put back on display. But trying to find all the components, is th that's the hardest thing. Over the road, you can see uh, there's an old building there now that whole block is going to be stage one of the new museum. Okay. So that's uh, 2,300 square metres. And what we're going to do with the museum is we're splitting it into two collections, the civilian collection and the military collection. Mm -hmm. So, because at this point in time we don't have, we've got 26 aircraft that are not on display, uh, which are being rebuilt. So we've got things like the sole surviving Battle of Darwin P-40 Kitty Hawk. We've got a DC-2, a DC-3, we've got the Wacket, the Boomerang, we've got the Mustang, the CA-17, uh, we've got our airworthy aircraft, the CT-4, we've got two Mackies, one Naval and one RAAF, uh, we've got the Lincoln, up on loan we've got uh, a Vampire and a Jindabik, mm -hmm. so a lot of aircraft still to go out. We've even got a Miles Messenger. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh brilliant. Yeah, so <laughs> that, that gives you an idea of uh, just how diverse the collection is. This aircraft was actually the very last aircraft pulled out of Tokemal. It was just sitting on uh, 44 gallon drums at the time. So they saved this one from scrapping, unlike the Mosquito. Uh, yep, Sunday drivers, we get a lot of hot rods out here. Um, so yeah, they, uh, they pulled it out. We've only just finished restoring it. Uh, and said a lot of work's been done. We've completely overhauled the canopy, which is why we've got the cover sitting over it to protect it. But uh, so, so to meet here, you, you've got cockpit open for people to climb in and, yes. and, and see. Which, and to be fair, driving in, that was sort of the first thing I saw was a little queue of a family all fighting over getting in it. Yep. If they're not doing that, they're really battling over the one next to it, which has become our most popular exhibit since arriving in November. This is actually a um, Aerospatial Dauphin 2 uh, helicopter, and it is the actual. Whilst it's not an Australian-made thing, it's actually the very first Victoria Police Air Wing helicopter. Oh wow. So, yeah, it was uh, VHPVF. It was used to rescue people from the Ash Wednesday bushfires in 1983. And more recently, it was used to rescue people out in Bass Strait during the Sydney to Hobart disaster in 1998. Oh, yeah. So, quite a few people think it was also the um, helicopter that was shot at by Julian Knight during the Hoddle Street Massacre, but that was a different, uh, that was actually a different helicopter. This one wasn't on that night. But uh, a very distinctive shape, and it just oh, sort of chimes back with people's memories of oh. of, of their history of the fact of, it's done up, up in the police livery yeah. too tends to stop people from speeding up the road because it's <laughs> uh, it's it's highly visible. But the beauty of it was when it came to us, it was actually owned by three former Air Wing pilots, and they wanted it to go to a good home. The police museum uh, had said no, we don't need it, so they offered it to us. We took it and they've been helping us rebuild it and do all of that sort of stuff ever since. So we do have a couple of spare parts that we're looking for, namely the finisterin at the back. As you can see, that's not real. Uh, as much as I'd like it to be, that's an industrial fan. And the other bit's a beer keg. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't think that'd take you anywhere somehow. <laughs> so, but they, look, they overhauled the winch. That's beautiful. That's worked out really, really well. Um, so there's a lot of things like that. We'll get the mini candle searchlight going soon. Uh, like everything, we just simply have to uh, keep doing them. You just nibble away at them bit by bit. So, now before we do the bow fighter, <laughs> I know, you, you're absolutely hanging on. Well, after trying to get into the freighter, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm, this, this might be as... Oh, you, you, think, you, think the, you think the freighter's bad? You haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> So what, what we'll do now is I'll take you next door to the yard where we have um, some of our aircraft that are stored and also uh, some of our projects that are going to become very large projects soon. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, 
So that's our, that's the rear of our Mackie, uh, the RAAF Mackie 54. It's very well known as the one that had the mid-air collision when it was doing a, a um, aerobatic manoeuvre with the roulette. And uh, it, that was actually roulette one and roulette four reared up underneath it and clipped it. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. 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 Um, so Jeff Trapper, who was the pilot, brought it down, no problems, aside from a lot of crinkling. And the other one, uh, he was a safe ejection and that aircraft crashed and was destroyed. So very fortunate to have it. Again, long-term restoration. Although I think there's, there's also a, an argument there that we can leave do, it as is. Yeah, do, do you restore it or do you leave it as, as it is so that, that people that's have what the we, story? That's what we have to analyse when we're doing these things. Do we want it in the way it was delivered or the way it you know, ended up? Or do we do it as a full restoration? I'd be inclined to leave it as it is. So this is actually the naval version, which is number 70. That was actually going to go to the scrapyard. So again, rescued just in time. But on the other side of that, <laughs> you might actually see it still says Napier Research on, on it. That's the centrifuge of the Lincoln. And for those of you that are unfamiliar, the Lincoln is, uh, I don't know what you'd say, it's a, it's a behemoth. Yes. You know, I mean, it sort of makes the Lancaster look vaguely small. So, uh, so the job is we've got most of it here. The tail section's still overseas, and uh, it's going to need a lot of work. But it's going to be converted into an Australian Mark 30, which was bigger again because it had the great big nose section at the front with yeah. the glass windows and all that. Um, it's yeah, it, it's quite staggering how big it is. But this will be the fourth one in existence. Because there's only other three that... Because there's the one at Cosford. And there's two in Argentina. Yeah. That's it. Because they're, they, they're doing the one in Argentina at the moment. I think they're cannibalising one to finish off the other. Ah, yeah. okay, so there might only end up being two. Could be. I, I don't know if they're doing both, but I, don't, I know they're definitely working on one. I might have to yeah. give them a call. Yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. Might be a language barrier. <laughs> so. I, I, I know someone who can put you in touch. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, definitely. Look, we'll, we'll happily work on anything and everything at this point because it'd be nice to get it over the, uh, get it I'm, over the line. I'm going to grab, as, as, a, as also a Napier fanboy, we're going to make sure we, we get a shot of that. One of the little museums over in uh, the UK actually sent me some fascinating stuff on that with all of the, the ice testing mm. uh, materials on that. We didn't get any of that. Uh, when it arrived, this is one of our storage sheds. <laughs> ah, this is it. Oh, oh. oh spiders' webs again. Oh, no, it's, yeah, it's, no, it's, no, yeah. they're fine. They're so this is the rest of 54, so you can see all the impact when it uh, crash landed. Oh, yeah, so you, yeah, you can, it, it sort of, on, on yeah. each frame, you can see it just sort of buckles as yeah, it goes back. Yeah, it did a spectacular job getting it down, so... To do take pictures as I step back into the spider's webs, ladies and gentlemen. This is the things I do for you. <laughs> Aha, and here we are. Uh, well, this is one of many. I've actually got quite a few of those. Um, and I can't remember which one this is, which is depressing. But uh, we've essentially got enough to build three Beauforts, which is a lot of aircraft. <laughs> so the issue that we have is that... Com comprehensive parts lists and drawings don't exist. Mm -hmm. So we're relying on a lot of things in terms of the existing aircraft, and there's not many of them. Uh, the other issue that we have, when the original ones came out to Australia, including our one, which is the oldest, uh, that's the oldest Beaufort in the world, number 13, they came out originally as Mark II, and then they were modified to Mark Vs which I believe was switching the engines over at that point from Taurus to uh, Pratt & Whitney. So that sort of means that a lot of the illustrated parts manuals don't match up when you're looking at part numbers. And then, of course, you've got the interchangeability with bow fighters where <laughs> there's like, oh, OK, there's a good, you know, it's a high percentage is interchangeable. Uh, so it becomes a, a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, I've been cataloguing a lot of parts lately and because uh, we've got four containers, shipping containers full of Beaufort parts and it's done my head in a number of times where I've just pulled all these things out and looking at the number going right great and you go you go to the parts list you're looking it up and something's not in here so uh, it's uh, so it, it boils down to whether or not you get um, you know, again what variant the actual aircraft is and obviously our goal is to make 13 as it was as yeah. number 13 
So, so let's let's just go through this. Beaufort is a variant of Blenheim, same as the Bolingbroke is a Canadian sort of one of these. They're all similar. Much yeah, much 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 they, they evolved out of the Blenheim yeah. essentially. Um, you guys went with the Bolingbroke, I think. Yeah. As a design, the UK went to the Beaufort, and we went to the Beaufort, and we got twenty delivered from the UK, uh, which were all T numbers. Ours was T nine five five two, and as I said, they were delivered as Mark twos, but upgraded to Mark fives, uh, and uh, yeah, and then it sort of went on to different variants up to Mark eights, I think it was. So, um, and by that stage, we were manufacturing them locally anyway so yeah there was a lot a lot of stuff went into them but even as you can see here i mean when you're looking there that's just the pilot seat there where the pilot seat would be there's not much room between that and everything else no. and it is raised up and then you've got the guns the uh, bomb aimer down the front again not much room there's a lot of stuff there <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it, it, just something that they were uh, really quite notorious for doing so yeah i suppose it's the old the old adage of, of, of weight, power, range. Yeah. You make it as small as you possibly can to get as far as you possibly can and mm. go for it. Yeah. But yeah. there you go. That, well, I mean, that doesn't that, help us. And that, that, that also sort of raises a, an interesting point. The um, bow fighter cannon bay doors that I was showing you that were given to me personally uh, last week, I wonder if they were made, even though they were never fitted in the end, but if they were made from wood instead because they wanted to carry heavier rockets and torpedoes. Mm. You just don't know because yeah. there's there's no sign of any modification records within the archives. So, and trying to get the notification of mod orders and things like that, it's very, very challenging. So it's yeah, guys, just doing the maths, doing the figuring out, saying what what can we what can we get away with? And they were doing you know they do numerous tests, and uh, some of the stuff would work, some of the stuff wouldn't. That was just the bottom line. This is a great shed. This is one of many. <laughs> That's the scary bit. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really terrifying. This this thing in front of us uh, that we're leaning on is a um, cockpit from a caribou, oh, right? And uh, it's it's one that we're actually going to use. That we can. Uh, it's literally just the instrument panels. Um, we've got the quadrants uh, stored away, but it's something that we can then take out to schools for their science and technology, mm. um, you know, open days or whatever, that kind of thing. Again, that whole thing of fostering a love for aviation and that sort of stuff. Though somebody was uh, quite uh, sarcastic. If you look at the actual aircraft number on the side. And a fourth or four seven. And a half. Oh, goodness, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't even say that. I'd say it's probably about an eight. But <laughs> it's, Yeah, definitely being generous about the half. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. definitely. There we are, right. but you know what? It, it's something kind of fun with that sort of thing. One of the beautiful things when the um, Canberra came down, and we were looking at before when it came down from Wagga and we we're going through it, they had a lot of apprentice crews working on it, mm -hmm. even though it was Gate Guardian, all signed. Oh, inside. fantastic. All dated, all signed, stenciled, everything. We've left all of that in there. You know, okay. there's no point in going over stuff like that. Again, you, you're talking about history. And we put it up uh, on Facebook at some point, and a couple of guys came forward. Oh, that's me! I was like, oh, you're the guilty one, right? So, yes. So, uh, so down the back, the big grey uh, wings—they're actually off our. Would you believe a Cessna three one zero? But it's relevant because our science, government science agency CSIRO, used that aircraft for cloud seeding trials. All oh, right. So okay. yeah, it's it's again, it's got to do with certain things that have happened here uh -huh. and all the other bits and pieces well you know i could don't know what they are to be honest i can tell you they're off planes but yeah def definitely big big bunch of planes there's some feet up there as well boots but yeah that's yeah, probably one of the members having a rest yeah you know? <laughs> that often happens so uh, yeah but no this is sort of we have to again we don't want to keep it outside so we keep you know, we're lucky that we've got these rooms yeah, so you, you, you've got the spaces to just keep things out of, out of the elements and yeah, and even with the new look, even when the new place is constructed, uh, there'll be a big workshop facility, yeah. and all of this will be put away and stored and all of that kind of thing, and that's just as important. So I, you've got the um, the fundraiser going for the the boat at the moment. At the moment, yeah. yeah. We're, so we're trying, we're basically uh, working to raise twelve thousand Australian dollars to complete the tail fins. 
because they're completely rotted out. They're mm. just beyond pitted. Um, so they've it, it, none of this stuff is cheap to start with. And if you're going to do a restoration, you want to do a restoration that you're not having to go back to every two to three years. Yeah. So, uh, and in terms of restorations, it's still cheaper because we're giving a lot of our time. Yeah. So that's the important thing there. So um, it's, look, it is what it is with this stuff. We just rely on being a volunteer group. We rely on the generosity of people to help us get these things over the line. So certainly some of the restorations could end up costing a million dollars. P40 is mm. probably a prime example of that. Yeah. Um, that's only just been, the fuselage has just been joined together for the first time in 20 years. But it's literally been pulled down rivet by rivet. So, but it's done to a standard that if you could find an engine that ran, you could easily get it up to airworthy. But for us, it's more important just to have a really top class display. And yeah. People come in and go, wow. So, so with that in mind, let's go to the bow fighter. That's yes. There we go. We've, we've been teasing everybody for long enough for that. I oh, know, I know, that's my fault. You don't worry, don't worry about the spiders in Australia. They just look big. Yeah. I've, I've walked face first into some golden orb spiders that are the size of my hand. Uh, it's, they're harmless. Uh, everyone freaks out when they see huntsman spiders. Uh, it's like, no, you just drop a ma um, matchbox on them. <laughs> you know, take it out, drop the matchbox, draws its legs in, you can take it outside. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if... Uh, I haven't sold I, you on the matchbox. No, I'm, I'm not. I think I'll, I'll, I'll go home and just worry about our teeny tiny ones that scare <laughs> you when they come out at night. <laughs> yes, that's... Uh... <sighs> so as far as bow fighters go, there's... Not many. No. Very few. So, just trying to think how many are actually left in the world. We've got the one being rebuilt to fly up in Sydney. And that's going to be a very long term project. Then we've got our one. How many are in the UK now? Well, there's Photo Collection have one that they're very slowly trying to do something with. Yep. The um, one at Dayton, which came from us. Yep. And you see, they haven't got the Zuz fasteners <laughs> sitting back properly off the. Uh, that's the cannon bay door that we were testing. Oh, right, of course. Uh, yeah. th this one's metal, and the one you've got next door is uh, wood. wood yeah. yeah. So, I've just taken the lock off. The rest is up to me. And now I've pulled the hatch down. <laughs> uh, uh, right. So, it's literally, yeah. if you look up in here. You look up. Yep. There's two red handles. <laughs> okay. And that, so you climb up the ladder here, or if you can call it that, and then you basically grab those and you lift yourself over into the cockpit. Right. That's how it works. It's incredible. Okay. Now, do you want me to hold that? You you hold that. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this on the phone as well, because I've promised people I do this on the phone. You're gonna as well. film this. <laughs> yes. Let's see if I can do this one-handed. Right. So let's. Get this going. Right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. So that's going up. This is not wide. <laughs> right, so let's see, up there. And up. There's a the cockpit. Kubrick-esque filming, this is not. <laughs> okay, red handle. He's making it. Oh, you've done it. There That's we go. Good. All right. Now pass this up. There we go. So, so again, it's the same thing. It's smaller than it looks on the outside, doesn't it? Yeah. It's uh, right. Let's sort of hunch back. Let's turn this round. See, we've got the. So that's an end station behind you. Yep. And obviously, there's map boxes, battery boxes. There's <laughs> just sharp it's angles on everywhere. <laughs> it's just the yeah. Right. I reckon I've left more of my DNA up here on the roof than uh, <laughs> you know, most people would do in a lifetime. So if I sort of step back here, we can get... Oh, there's a... There's... Well, so, actually, given what we've just been through, yeah. this is bigger than I thought it'd be. Ah, there you go. Yes, there we are. So it's I've primed you well. You have, yeah. But here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Let's 
get back into here. We've got nav station. That fantastic bubble as well at the back, which uh, very prominent. Two radios. Yeah, two radios with a coupler. Yep. And then behind all of that are the oxy tanks, and um, there's fairly big wiring loom there at the moment um, for the um, downward identification lights. <coughs> so you can imagine getting this back from Port Sea down on the beach. Uh, it was a long restoration, and unfortunately, the boys, little boys, had used the rear as a loo, so the tail of the section was rotted out. Oh no! Uh, but we were able to rebuild that with the remains of another. Um, interesting above you too. There's the hydraulic tank, so it's not hidden away somewhere. It's very visible, and um, and so, that, so this bit above my head here. Which is not coming through great on the video, but that's the hydraulic tank up just to this, yeah, this, is, in the, this is the hydraulic tank. Uh, one thing to remember with this aircraft, unlike any other bow fighter, this one's live, really it still lives. So, uh, when people aren't around, we'll cycle the props just very gently, mm -hmm. uh, just make sure everything's ticking over, and then we'll hand cycle the flaps as well, which all the that's where the fluid comes from. That's why you can see there's still fluid sort of leaking around. and all of that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, it hasn't done a full scale engine run since I think 1989. I'll probably be corrected on that. Okay. Uh, but that was when it was moved indoors. And naturally we can't run it in here, it'd just simply blow everything else out through the wall. Uh, <laughs> which we really don't want to have as much as we'd love to gear it up. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly something. Well this, this, is, this is extraordinary, but you just sort of think, Long, very long ops in these things. Oh yeah, and yeah, you know, just once you're in, you're in. I suppose when you're the pilot, and the guy yeah. down the back has at least got a little bit more room to <laughs> shift you about a little bit. Yeah, and hence the fact they probably had those uh, windows up the front, the little push-out windows for um, ventilation. Yeah, ventilation and things like it does. Even on a normal day, if you've got a couple of people in here working, it gets hot quickly. Mm. Uh, and that's always been a thing. Um, me, me wearing a jumper is not the. Uh, the smartest this, no, no, this just, morning. You'll just, you'll just end up evaporating. But obviously, I mean, you're literally surrounded by all the electrics, like right there mm -hmm. uh, with you. And there'd be more cabling too. That's the DF antenna. Um, you know, we've got junction boxes up here. But see, what I was saying how little actually goes into running the plane. I mean, there's not that much in the way of, you know, no. lines uh, going through and uh, all of that. The scary thing is, one of these could sink in three minutes. <laughs> So, and is the, is the only way out back through that hatch? Uh, no. Is, so, okay, you've got a kick-out panel here to the left. Right. Oh, sorry, to the right, I mean, there. Mm -hmm. And you've also got one above you uh, in the cockpit. You've got one there on the bubble there. Yep. Um, and out on the left wing, there is a dinghy under a panel. Okay. So, yeah, there's, there's ways, but you'd have to be really fast. And that's assuming that you actually make a smooth landing and you're not going in nose first or anything yeah. like that. Um, no, and there's been some pretty tragic stories that we've uh, come across too with uh, things like... Um, so I've just found an artefact of some sort that I've got no idea, some sort of oil thing. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that because the cockpit seat, um, the pilot seat, is actually spring-loaded, so when you jump in there... The idea is it snaps forward yeah. and locks you into place. Uh, there's a story of one pilot who took off and the spring snapped and it actually pushed him forward into the control column. They just went straight to the ground. They didn't, oh. have, didn't have a hope. So, yeah. But when we're doing stuff and cycling the props and doing all of those kind of things, we just plug a battery yeah. in here. And what's awesome is because all the cabin lights come on and everything lights up and it's just like, yeah. It's a good feeling. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, they're the kind of unique things that we get to see um, when we're doing stuff. And look, we'd love to be able to do it again. But uh, as I've said, it's dealing with 80-year-old metal that unfortunately uh, was not designed to ever last that no. long. And uh, uh, even if it looks okay, uh, there's every bit, there's every chance that there's probably some stuff going on underneath mm -hmm. that's where you have to be really careful with any of these restorations because uh, you don't want things shaking apart or coming off yeah and, th and that's that is the key point these things were not built to last they were designed and made as quickly as possible to 
Well, it's the same with the amount of training that some yeah. of the pilots had. You know, they only had 20, 30 hours training and they were pushed into these aircraft. I remember reading a document somewhere from CAC regarding the CA-17 Mustangs that if they had, I think it was more than seven hours in the air without you know, being written off or crashing, whatever, they were considered to have made their money back. So wow. it, it was something like that, just a ludicrously low hour time. So, yeah, I think it's a... Uh, yeah, the cost of war is sometimes you know, quite ridiculous. And people have raised that with us here in the past as well. I don't know if they get the same thing over in the UK, but, you know, the, the accusation is that we're glorifying war by having these aircraft on display. Um, and we really don't glorify yeah. war. It's not about that. It's actually about celebrating um, the ability to make these things, to the ability for people to actually design things under extreme uh, pressure in times of crisis and also showing the technological advancements that have happened you know from the very early days right through to now so it's uh, yeah it's it's not something that you know we hear saying and yeah. it's it's explaining the reality of it as well and oh it is yeah, it is i mean and we've said to schools that come through and they ask us those questions and we're, we're straight out blunt and we say look there's, really there's no winners mm. you know that's you know you have to look at the number of people that died uh, from the um uh, the, the squad with the dam busters and uh, yeah. lank raids uh, it's just astronomic waste of life that they were doing it because they felt a duty that they had to because the threat was real so yeah, I'm glad that we sort of live in peacetime sort of uh, <laughs> and, but it's, it's, it's a joy to be able to at least look at these things and share the stories but also the fun stories like you know this was being used as playground equipment which yeah. you wouldn't get away with these days <laughs> Uh, but also for people to, and they're actually genuinely in awe and you do see people in here who are looking at certain things um, you know people who are much older and it takes them back you can see it's taking them back to a point so um, to be able to do that but then to have the younger kids coming through and going oh, I want to be a pilot I want to um, get into this sort of stuff we've had people who uh, were museum members then they went on to university one of them ended up on a scholarship um, doing the uh, Eurofighter project oh wow so yeah so it's sort of and that's that's when you feel really good with that sort of stuff another guy was actually uh, he ended up in uh, the Air Force and was looking after engine changes on the Hornets so yeah it's <laughs> you know that you've sort of done things to a point and sort of helped foster that yeah love and you know, wanting to uh, do things within um, aviation going forward. So, heck, even if you're just flying a little Cessna or a Piper or something like that, you know, doesn't matter. That's all part of it. Well, this this has been extraordinary. And I never thought I'd actually get inside one of these. And... Uh, it's a it's a special aircraft. It's it's one that I personally, it's my favourite, and one that I always dedicate time to just potting around and you know, sort of. You know, some people like, you know, we're wearing a little cap and the walking stick and going out on farmyards and things like that. Me, no, I'll sit in the back of the plane and just clean and just sort of, you know, look at things. And <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, I, I guess the, the, the cleaning roads are here is pretty... No, it's pretty non-stop. Yeah. Absolutely non-stop. You know, it's, all you have to have is a windy day and then everything's full of dust and uh, all of that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, ironically... Um, some of the stuff like Mr. Sheen furniture polish actually puts a really good layer of protection on mm. things so that when it does get dusty, you can just simply wipe down. So I, I remember reading Roland White's book about mm. um, Harriers and, and the Falklands, and they, the standard procedure on the Royal Navy was to cover everything in WD-40. Yeah, it sounds yeah. about right. You think to high heaven, but it sounds about right. I mean, that's the that's really all it is. Increase their radar visibility, though, apparently. Fish oil does that? Okay, yeah, fair Apparently enough. so, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> You, you, you learn you learn weird things in strange well, I'll, 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 keep, I'll keep that in mind for the next trivia night down the pub so <laughs> oh that spins all the way around yeah it spins oh. all the way around it's bulletproof <laughs> mine's a ton uh, <laughs> yeah, so, but I suppose they had to uh, have things like that in order to be able to um, yeah well, there we go I'm actually sitting in the back now ladies and gentlemen and you can see there's another access point down there too there's another yeah. hatch so yeah, the pilot would get up through this one, the nav would get up through there, which is obviously a space thing, because if they're in a hurry, they need to really get a leg on. And the other thing you've got to remember too, when they're getting on board, they were carrying all the things like the parachutes and all of that sort of stuff. Oh, yes, definitely. So I guess they'd, there'd be stowage for those, because you wouldn't, yes. wouldn't be wearing them. And of course, the pictures I've seen of them, they're not wearing 
a lot of flying kit, are they? They're sort of shorts and tops because they're low level the whole way. Low level, and by the time you got up north, going into New Guinea, the humidity up there is just off the scale. So were they, let's, let's, let's do the whole thing. What's the story for this particular aircraft? Do we know it? Yeah, this one never actually saw service. It was delivered the day the Pacific campaign ended. All right. So instead of seeing active service, it went off uh, to become a target tug. Uh, so it was used for a whole bunch of uh, operations to do with uh, target tug towing and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and then from there it went on to the playground. So it's a, a career as a tug. Yep. And then straight off for people to climb around on it. Exactly. And, and now in its own way, I suppose, it's still for people to climb around on. But there's a big there's a big kid here. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Right but <laughs> it's probably in a far more uh, organised manner, and certainly without people using the rear as a loo either. So, you know, that's got to be a plus. But uh, yeah, it's um, and it, even though it's uh, three two eight, uh, the number is uh, three two eight. It's done up as uh, a different aircraft to commemorate thirty one squadron, who paid for it to be painted outside. Oh, okay. So the the squadron paid. For Chucked in for a bit of the restoration as well. Yeah, for the paintwork on the outside. Um, it has had a number of uh, different liveries uh, in its life. When it was discovered in Portsea, it was uh, silver, which was one of the classic target tug finishes with the bl black and yellow stripes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and then it came out here and it was, it, I think at one point it might have even been black and it was certainly a different shade of green on the outside, uh, but now it's... That colour uh, on the outside now is known as Moorabbin Green with Dulux. It's actually a proper paint allocation. So it's as close as we can get to the original colours, which is fantastic. And even nowadays, the technology to do this stuff is unbelievable. I mean, you see sometimes with Avro Ansons, for instance, you know, there's that yellow colour that a lot of the Ansons yeah. are, but a lot of them have been done up as a little bit too mustard-like yeah. in the colour. Whereas the original Ansons um, were very close to a lot of the Tiger Moth mm -hmm. colours. So we've got a bit of fabric off an original Tiger Moth it's, with it's, the yellow and you yeah. just simply, we've just fed it into the computers at the um, at the paint places and now it's all matched. Because it's almost like that um, uh, American mustard yellow, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Sort of, it is. Yeah, it is and it's, it's too pale. Yeah. It's, it's just too pale for, for that. Um, I mean, we had all sorts of different colour schemes for Anson's over here, you know, from silvers to um, you know, the camos and then the yellows, that sort of stuff. But, uh, yeah, as I said, the yellow ones that I've seen, um, yeah, they're just that little bit too pale to really sort of jump out at you uh, as such. But that's okay. Look, anyone who's uh, game enough or stupid enough, depending on which way you look at it, <laughs> to actually you know get onto these things and try and save as much of it, you know, all power to them. That's I know, and I've managed to amass a factory full of bits and pieces over the last nine years, starting off with my granddad's shed when I cleaned it out. Um, I know people had said it was a you know we said it was a shed, but you can park ten cars in it really. Uh, <laughs> and like people from um, uh, Duxford had already gone through it, the War Memorial had gone through it. Um, they've got lots of stuff out of there, and when I came on, the, it had been picked over, but I still threw out 16 tonnes of rubbish, of all sorts of machinery and whatever, but I came home with three tonnes of aircraft parts. And it's like, so, not hoarding it, been selling it, trading it, whatever, and then just getting bits for my own collections, the things I want. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm quite happy to do all of that, and I think that's really important. Um, you know, see these, see these carb cutout switches here? Yeah. Now, I, I don't know why, but Grandad bur buried a huge bag of them in his garden. <laughs> so I pulled out 50 pairs, and they all still work, and it was just one of those things. So I put them up, and now they've gone on into projects and all of that sort of thing. So I actually got to send some over to the UK to go into a Miles Magister. Oh, right, of course, because it's all, all the same all the same case. Yep, 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 yep. So... Yeah, it's quite funny with that sort of stuff. It's amazing, but nothing makes me happier than seeing those things going into places. Now, I went and cleaned out another property where I ended up with over 400 um, inertia switches for the engines, and they're all still boxed, brand new. Oh, wow. I was like, all right, well, that's cool. So I just put them up, five bucks a pop, and they've all gone out to the relevant collections, and you know, people keep spares and that, but you just, that's it. That's all it, that's all it really is. You know? I could just sit on the whole pile and go, oh, it's all mine. But it's not. It's not. <laughs> and, and, and some and some do. And I know they do, yeah. but it's not worth it. You know, and the, you know the, what I might have and what somebody else might have, they may have something I want, but to them it's gold. To me, it's not. Mm -hmm. So it's like you know, things have a way of going around.
you and this has been fantastic. Thanks, I'm thanks so for glad it. you've enjoyed your trip, and I hope the listeners have enjoyed the crazy walk around here. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a few that are properly, properly annoyed no. that they're not here because this is a fantastic collection. Now, if you come to the Avalon Air Show next year, make sure you set aside some time. But if you don't do that, go to www.aarg.com.au, which is our website. And that gives you all the information you need and also has links to um, donations if you can support us with our restorations, that would be awesome. Uh, or even follow us on Facebook at Moorabbin Air Museum. So we'll put all those in the description, ladies and gentlemen, so you'll be able to do it. I'm going to continue to crawl around in this thing for as long as you and let me. So thank you very much for listening. And until next time, take care. I hope you enjoyed our virtual tour of the Moorabbin Air Museum with you and MacArthur. I've put the links to the museum, their social media pages, all in the description below. Please do check them out, give them a follow. And if you can support them, that would be amazing because the projects that they have going on at the moment are incredible. Of course, if you can support us as well, that'd be fantastic. And it's as easy as leaving a quick review on your podcast app of choice. It helps with the algorithms, and makes it easier for people to find us. You could also tell your friends that would be ace as well. If you fancy getting a little bit more involved, we have a Patreon where you can get bit of merch and thank you cards from me there's a discord server where we can talk about all things aircraft as well links for that are in the description below coming up next week we will have a rather different discussion as we look to the future to see what the future of aviation holds please join us then and until next time thank you so much for listening the damcasters is hosted and produced by matt bone and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.